Thank you for being here tonight. Would you take your Bible and join me uh, tonight? And um, just by way of uh, introduction, would you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2? 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Next week, we will join back in to our study and series in the book of Hosea. We uh, took several weeks off of that, and, uh, but uh, next week, we will be back in the book of Hosea, and uh, Hosea uh, chapter 9, and so looking forward to being back in that series with you. And, uh, but would you notice uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and would you notice... Verse 4, the Bible says, In my speech, this is 1 Corinthians chapter 2, And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. There's a reason that we study the Bible here, and there's a purpose behind being in church. There is a, there is a benefit to God's Word being proclaimed continually. And Paul said that it doesn't matter what type of anecdotes or funny stories that people tell, and, and, and all those have their place. Paul said that what makes a difference is that God's Word is proclaimed, and it's done in spirit and in power. Well, where does that come from? How is that obtained by coming to a building like this? Does that happen because we show up? Where does the power and spirit of God come from and and how does a individual's life change it comes through the word of God and Paul said that listen we are not here to bring people to church and for them to be enticed with our words in other words we don't come just so we can feel good about ourselves now, I'll be honest with you, that's not real popular. But it is important that we understand, do you want power or do you want popularity? Do you want the power of God on your life or do you want to be known? Because I'm going to tell you something. You read through the scriptures and you read about the individuals in the Bible and you'll find one common thread throughout the scriptures the people that God used did not become real popular. Oh, their names may be in this book and recorded, but I'll tell you what, they went through hardships in life. A girl asked her mommy, Mommy, does every fairy tale begin with once upon a time? which her mom replied, no. Fairy tales begin when a Christian says, now that I have become a Christian, I don't have any problems to worry about. That's a fairy tale. That does not display or accurately define the Christian life, does it? How many of you have had some problems since you've been saved? Can I hear an amen there? It's amazing to me sometimes that the world is a garbage dump. In taking the garbage from my house to the garbage dump, my car stinks long after the garbage has been eliminated. 
either it has leaked or just the ambient smell has leaked through and maybe you buy those smelly bags I refuse to pay the extra money to take garbage out because I've never been able to make garbage smell good but when you walk through this garbage heap of the world it'll get a little stink on you sometimes that stuff sticks and sometimes life stinks and sometimes the Christian though gets the thought that man I know Jesus and I know I know God and I, and I attend church and why is this happening to me but we often forget that we live in a satanic world and in talking about a New Year's resolution for the believer and wrapping this message up tonight we have learned that although my identity has changed I am no longer let, let me just make sure you get it I'm no longer a sinner but a saint in God's eyes he has taken my sin and given me his righteousness so as far as God sees when he looks at me he sees his son and when he looks at you he sees his son he sees the paid redemptive price in you so I don't feel that way it's not about how you feel it's about who you are and although my identity and I am secure in that I know I'm accepted I know I am secure I know I am significant in Christ and I I, I have those things uh, rooted in the Bible and I'm confident of what Christ has said and what the Bible teaches still I have to be reminded I am living on the enemy's turf and stuff happens things come against us but you and I are no longer a part of this world system we used to be a part of it but we are not a part of it anymore that we're now that we're saved but yet we must function and live in it every day coming to church is the easy part of the Christian life this is not hard right would you say amen to that is coming to church hard yes or no then why are so many Christians absent from the church yet go out in the world and complain how hard it is at least us coming to church get a little bit of reprieve amen at least we come to church and get a little bit uh, 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 of a uh, of a reprieve and a rescue out of the world to come here and kind of just kind of take a big breath and and get recharged spiritually if you if it's speaking and and I'm not trying to spiritualize just come to church but man that's what the Bible and the teaching of God's Word does man it gets me through another day and in my Bible study it gets me through another hour and praying to God gets me through another hard moment and yet Christians walk through the Christian life in this journey struggling wondering why me what did you expect what did you expect and you've got to remember that God wants to use you Christian as an ambassador on the enemy's turf nothing shines brighter to a dark world than when a Christian who is going through times of difficult and suffering and anguish and, and hard times for the world to see the light of Jesus in that believer and they go man how did you ever get through it man what an opportunity you have to give them a three-point sermon right there say what's the three points Jesus 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 you have the opportunity to absolutely proclaim the gospel to others 
And remember, that's what I first told you. A New Year's resolution for you ought to be to just be determined to zealously proclaim Jesus more this year. What kind of church would we have? I'm not talking about a building. Who cares about that? I'm talking about a body of vibrant uh, believers. What type of church would we have if just a few of us got more committed about zealously proclaiming Jesus? What, what would happen? I'll tell you what would happen. People's lives would be changed. People would hit that altar, man. People would get saved. People might shout in the service, Woo! I'd hate for this service to get interrupted because the Spirit of God started moving. Hold the phone. Hold the music. Somebody is getting right with God. Wouldn't that be something if God interrupted the service and said, You know what? I'm going to change what you're doing. Wouldn't that? Some people would be uncomfortable in the Baptist church. Well, that's not on the order of service. I know it ain't, because that's what you wrote. I'm wanting to do a new thing. But you know what? We've got to have a heart to want it and to do it. I have found that people typically will come to church if you invite them. Now, it may take several times. You have to just, you know, you, you kind of almost have to stalk them. I mean, if they, if they threaten to call 911, you back off a week and then get right back on it. Uh, but it may take that. But do you remember last time I told you also a good resolution for us as believers is for this year for us to daily renew our minds through God's Word. Remember, the world is a garbage heap. No amount of potpourri spray is going to remove the garbage. And it just covers the smell. God says in a, in a way to get the garbage out of your life is to renew the garbage that's been dumped in here. You know, your cranium can hold a lot of garbage. You know that? There's garbage from years ago that I... That man Satan likes to bring up, man, he'll, he'll hit the rewind button on the VHS. Do you know, you remember VHS? I know that's old school, but, and uh, that's kind of still a little bit what's going on up there. And, uh, I mean, he ain't hitting the DVD or the DVR. Man, he's still hitting the VHS. And all of a sudden, that, that you know, something will come back. You're like, man. And I can't delete that stuff. But that's where Christ and His Word lets us know that we can be an effective ambassador if we will allow ourselves to be renewed by the wa washing of the Word, the Word of God. But you will be ineffective as a Christian if you think like the world thinks. If you talk like the world talks. If you listen to what the world listens to, if you watch what the world watches, if you go where the world goes, then you will be ineffective and sidelined as a Christian in impacting others. See, Satan's goal is to corrupt your mind. Would you look at 2 Corinthians? You're in first. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And look at verse 3. 2 Corinthians 11 verse 3, Paul said, But I fear, not that he was scared, but I have a great concern. This concerns me. Some would say worry. This is a concern. Concern is, is a little bit more um, heartfelt. Worried is almost an emotional thing. Paul says, I am, I am concerned for your well-being. Why? Lest by any means as the serpent beguiled, tricked, duped, lied, 
to Eve through his subtlety, his, his craftiness. He is a conniver. He's sneaky. So your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. How does Satan corrupt your mind? He continually seeks to indoctrinate you in the world's way of thinking. That's how he does it. If he can develop, listen to me, if Satan can develop an appetite in you to want to divulge yourself in what the world offers, if he can create an appetite in you for what the world gives, then he knows eventually by yourself you will hunger and crave what the world offers and you will have a distaste for the sound doctrine of God's Word, you will love it less and less and less and less and less. You will love it less and less. And Satan knows that. Would you look at Colossians chapter 2 with me? Keep going to the right. Colossians chapter 2. Galatians, Ephesians, Colossians. All of those are right after 1st and 2nd Corinthians. Look at Colossians chapter 2. Look at verse 3 and then 7 and 8. Colossians 2 verse 3 then 7 and 8. Notice the Bible says that in Christ in whom are hid all the treasures and wisdom and knowledge. That's in Christ, that's in God, that's in the Father. Notice verse 7, rooted and built up in Him. Notice Christ, established in the faith as ye have been taught. Abounding there with thanksgiving. See, you need to be taught. The Christian needs to be taught. We need to be taught God's Word. Why? It roots us and grounds us in Christ. But Satan will also teach some things. And it will not root you in holy and righteous things. It will root you in worldly things. But notice verse 8. Beware. Here's a warning. Warning. Lest any man spoil you through philosophy... And vain deceit. After the tradition of men, what we think is important, what we like, after the rudiments of the world, after their system, after what they love, after what the world sees as important, Paul says. And notice this last part of verse 8. And not after Christ. Satan will give you an appetite for everything else and not Jesus. You know, the, even the church is good at traditions. I'm all for traditions when they have value and when they have purpose. But sometimes we do things because that's the way we like to do them. Traditions are great. But when it comes to the things of God and what we introduce the lost world to in this place, when they come to freedom, are we more interested in indoctrinating them in traditions that we hold dear to or to the doctrine and teaching of God's holy word? Say, well, Pastor Larry, I... Sure, it's God's Word. That should be our desire, but sometimes we can, we can fog the window up to where it's not really clear what we're trying to promote or what we want them to see. And it's easy to do that if we're not daily renewing our mind through God's Word. God's word wipes away, it's the defrost 
for the window. It makes it become clear. And I'm going to tell you, Satan wants to keep the scales on over your eyes. He wants to keep the veil uh, pulled over. He wants to fog up the window to where you can't really tell what God really wants. We must constantly be alert and guard our minds to that from that which would indoctrinate us in the world's way of thinking. Listen, you can't isolate yourself from the world. That's not what this is about. But just because you're in the world doesn't mean you are of the world. And you aren't. Problem is, though, you have believers who knowingly indulge in and feed on worldly things. The result will only be a worldly lifestyle. Listen to me and listen very closely. If you are concerned about a loved one who is living in sin, who once used to be in church and now is out of church, or you even know this person so personal that you know they're playing church, then you need to have a heart-to-heart -heart with them and find out what are they feeding on. Because I can promise you, listen to me now, if they are feeding on worldly things, no wonder they don't have an appetite for the church. No wonder they don't have an appetite for the Bible. You can't get them in a prayer meeting. You can't get them in a Bible study. You can't get them in a church service. Why? They're so fat on the world. They're not hungry for the things of God. They aren't hungry for those things anymore. They have literally indulged themselves on the world's things. And so no wonder they live a worldly lifestyle. And Christian, if that is you, repent and turn to God and get right with Him. Clean it up. Let me tell you something now. Worldly believers lead to worldly churches. And my concern is, as I told the men last night, the church may be full of tares. You know the difference between wheat and tares? Tares are absolutely what will choke the wheat out and starve it. And the tares are good for nothing. It's what you throw away. It's what you cast off. And that's why the Bible talks about a separating of the wheat and the tares. And it's important that the Christian stands up and that they're clearly visible in the world. Why? I'm a wheat. I'm not a tare. I don't want to be known as a tear. I don't want to be seen as a tear. I don't want to be talked about as a tear. I want the world to know no allegations, no assumptions. That man is a wheat for God, not a tear. May the church of God, may his bride stand up and may they daily be renewed in their mind so there's no doubt when the world looks at the church and if they show up at Freedom Baptist Church, they see a Christian who is right with God, who is praising God, and who wasn't cursing at the water cooler on Friday and then lifting their hands to uh, the worship songs on Sunday. My friend, God is not looking for hypocrites. He's looking for a church church who is blood bought and will stand up for his son Jesus Christ. That is what he's looking for. And if you don't daily renew your mind then you will lead this place to a worldly church. And worldly believers make up a worldly church. And Paul said that people have a form of godliness but they deny the power thereof. In meeting with the men last night, and a very lengthy meeting, meeting with the new deacons that we've added or appointed, as the Bible says, 
I shared with them some things that, uh, uh, for vision and direction and just some things that God have laid on my heart. One of those is developing really who we are and summing it all down, taking our constitution, our all of that, and defining it for who we are because it's a mess. And you can't understand it. And it doesn't define who we are, although it ought to describe who we are. And it doesn't. But one of those things, uh, as just laying it out as pillars, the Bible says that the church is the pillar and ground of truth. And that word pillar means sedentary rock. It means a, something that cannot be moved. It's unmovable. It's unshakable. It is steady. It's unchanging. And one of the things that our church must have, have as one of its pillars is that we will absolutely, uh, without apology, preach on the authority of God's Word. I mean, thus saith the Lord. And we ought to have that as a church, without compromise, without apology. Listen, if you don't like sin to be preached against, listen, this ain't your church. If you want to come and feel good about yourself and have some smoke and mirrors and a revolving ball, this is not your church. 426 times in the Bible, the Bible says, Thus saith the Lord. If God ain't saying it, I don't want to hear it. And we ought to be coming to hear God's word and to be renewed so we can go out there and impact lives. And the reason it, lives are not being impacted in our community and in the world is because the church has become the world. We look and act and talk and smell just like the world. And we have a form of godliness, but we deny the power thereof. We know how to play church and play religion, but the power of God is not changing people's lives. And Satan laughs all the while. There's another ignorant believer that I have assimilated into my world system. Don't get caught up in that. Don't get caught up in his snare. God has so much better for you. And you have, you have digressed to that. If you, it's beneath you. It's not who you're called to be. God has called you for a greater purpose. You are under new management. And you are absolutely not living up to who you have been called to be in Christ Jesus. So does your daily life evidence a renewed mind? God left you in this world for a reason. And that is so you and I could be a light and help bring people out of darkness and out of the satanic world system that we live in. You can make an impact on, your, on God's team. Some people say, well, I don't mind being a water boy for God. No, I, the water boy's on the sideline. I want to be in the game. Put me in, coach. I want to be in the game. Give me the ball. I'm going to score. I'm going to knock somebody's head off in the process. I'm going to score. Give me the ball. I'm determined. I can remember walking on the football field as a freshman in high school and looking out and saying, hey, is that the best they can do? So that's pretty cocky. No, I was just confident that I could do it. And let me say something. Our confidence is not in our flesh. Our confidence and sufficiency is in Christ Jesus. And I am a more than a conqueror through him who loved me and gave his life for me. I'm telling you, we can make a difference, not in us, but through Christ. Coach, put me in. I want to be on the field, not on the sidelines. You can make a difference, but Satan wants to put you on the sideline. God doesn't need any cheerleaders. Matter of fact, he doesn't need any coaches. That's amazing. God doesn't need any referees. 
God's looking for people who just says, I'll do it. I'll go. That's what God's looking for. God's not looking for ability. He's looking for availability. Will you make yourself available this year? Or will you be sidelined? So I don't plan on being sidelined. Neither do I. But listen to me. You and I will be sidelined this year. If I and you don't choose to renew our mind daily. That means when the garbage gets in, you take it out. Now I'm going to tell you something that happened to all of us. The slightest thing, someone can sow a negative thought, and you'll be rotten and stinking and cynical all day long because someone said something to you. And you know what? We do it to people too. We'll find something we don't like, and all of a sudden we'll speak, and all of a sudden it's like, man, they didn't even, they didn't even know about that. They weren't thinking about that. Now, I just sowed dissension or, or, or contention among another brother and sister. Instead of just, you know what? God's, let's just talk about the goodness of God. And you, you're a mess up, I'm a mess up, but when we fess up, he gets it right, and he cleans it up, and... And, and you know what? He's, he's all that we need. You know, we sing it. Jesus, all I need. He's all I need. He's all I need. You know, I'm not so sure that the church believes that at times. He's all I need on Sunday, but come Monday, I'm, I got it all. I got it. No, no. No more of that. So this year, zealously proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ and renew your mind. One last verse and then we close. Look at 2 Corinthians. Would you go back to, to the left there? I, you're probably still in Colossians if you're not. Just go to 2 Corinthians, Corinthians with me. And look at chapter 6, 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And uh, let's look at this. This is God's call to you and to me and to all those who name the name of Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, look at verse 14 through 18. Believers, be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with dark? What concord hath Christ with Belial, which is a god, a false god? What part hath he that believeth with an infidel, someone who just absolutely just mocks God and, and just so agnostic towards him. And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye, you, Christian, believer, are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and I will walk in them and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, look at this. Come out from among them. There is your call. Come out! Everybody else is coming out of the closet. Won't the Christian come out of the closet? Right? I can't believe he said that. Well, I said it. Come out. Come on, Christians. Come out. Come out. Come out. Come out. From among them. Come out. You're a wheat, not a tear. Come out. Come on out. Notice. And be ye separate. What? Yeah. Don't just come out and go back in. Stay out. 
You're not a gopher. Six more weeks of winter. If the groundhog comes out, we come out to church, go back in the world. Come out to church, go back in the world. Jesus said, come out from among them and be ye separate. Saith the Lord. That's some preaching. That'll preach. You don't hear that much. And touch not the unclean thing. And I will receive you. And I will be your a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. I will do it. I will give you the power and the strength to make a difference in and impact lives this year. But I'm going to tell you, you have a part, Christian, and that is get out from the tares. Get out of the darkness. Get out of the closet, spiritually speaking, and come out and live unto Christ. Separate from the world system. Separate from that ideology and from its filth and its garbage. Separate from that world system and live unto Christ. That's the call. Live unto me, Jesus says. Live unto me. Let's pray. Father, we love you and we thank you for tonight. And God, that's the message. That's the call. Nothing else needs to be said. May we not just be hearers, but may we be doers. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.